Hey there, friends, back again. And this time I'm going to talk with you about mind mapping. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to mind map because that has already been covered, certainly in the photo reading whole mind system and as an activation technique, because we want to become active in our process, in our learning process, and certainly in the conversation with the author. And we want to be able to take some notes, some significant notes. So I am going to show you several different mind maps, and you'll be able to see for yourself how they can be applied in a variety of different ways based on your needs. I'm going to show you hand-drawn maps, and I'm going to show you some maps that I designed on the computer. And typically when I design them on the computer, it's because I want to use that information for presentation purposes or as a handout in my coaching practice. So you'll get to see both. But let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a talk, maybe at church or in a meeting or a seminar, and the presenter was dropping nuggets, and there you were trying to capture the notes, and, and you're trying to capture those sentences and those phrases, and, and they kept talking. And there's a part of you that wanted to say, wait, stop, back up, can you repeat that? But that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so there you were frustrated because you were trying to capture that golden nugget. <laughs> well, mind mapping solves that problem because what you do is you capture the essence of what's being said, just using a few keywords, and then you can reconstruct the conversation later for your own purpose. And as you review that information, it helps to solidify it and also build a stronger neural network inside of your brain. So that's the purpose of mind mapping. It is a brain-friendly way of taking notes. It's quick and easy. And once you get the hang of it and you get to loving it like I do, oh my gosh, it's a it's a, just quite a joy. Now, when I'm talking, excuse me, when I'm cooking, I love listening to talks, TED Talks, YouTube Talks. I just put them on and oh my gosh, it just, it just knocks me out so that I'm active and listening and enjoying things. And I was listening to a talk one day. It was so good. It was a short talk. I listened all the way through, but it was so good. I was like, oh, I got to go back and take some notes on that because I'm going to make a handout on that talk. And here it is. It was a talk called Five Ways to Disarm a to Toxic Person by Meredith Miller. And this is what I got. When I went back and I captured the notes, I created this map. So she says, breathe, set boundaries, observe attention and phrasing. So real quick, just a little bit on each. Number one, breathe. When we're dealing with a tense situation, that's really good advice. She says, breathe. She says, don't react in the moment. Distance yourself and just remain calm. Number two, set boundaries. Okay, you could say something like, well, that's interesting or that's possible and deflect, but don't engage. Okay, and you can agree to disagree. It's okay to draw the line. That's important to know and to remind ourselves. Then there's observe. Watch yourself and the other. Now, it starts with self because we have to observe ourselves. Like, why am I getting triggered every time this person says something? It turns into an argument. But you know what? Don't engage. Just observe <laughs> them and most important, yourself. Because you can't control anybody else, only self. Witness with detachment or observe without judgment. We talked about in the last session, the whole thing about witness becoming the internal witness. Don't take anything personally. Attention. Don't give it. Never give an emotional reaction to a toxic person. It's just not worth it. You know what happens. <laughs> Let's not go there. And then there's phrasing. So she gives suggestions on things that you could say. You could say, well, that's interesting. That way you don't discount the other person because they've got their point of view and you have to honor it whether you like it or not. You could say, well, that's possible. Or I see you feel strongly about that. Or we can agree to disagree. And you could close with something as simple as, you know what? I hope you get to feeling better. You know, I'm working on my stuff. Take ownership. Leave that alone. So that's an example of having listened to a talk, took some notes on it, and then I used it um, to um, share with some of the people in my coaching practice. Uh, there's a uh, little known work of a woman named Claudia Howard, who uh, created something called the Laws of Human Worth, Howard's Laws of Human Worth. She's a psychiatrist, and I liked it. And when I found this work, I was like, oh my God, I've got to capture that so I can share it with others. So here we have, she says, you have unconditional worth as a human being. 
we all are equal. We have equal worth. And then the externals, you know, like, you know, how much you have or, you know, what kind of car you drive, none of that either adds or diminishes to just your intrinsic worth as a human being. Your worth is stable regardless of anything else. And it's beyond proving. And then there's a few little notes, you know, in the, each of the categories. So, but here's the thing about this. I created some questions and turned it into a handout that I like to use especially when I'm working with young people to talk to them about self-worth. <laughs> so see what you can do with mind mapping. You know, the sky is the limit in terms of your own creativity. Here's a book that many people know about. It's been around for a long time. It's a beloved book. It's called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Now, what I did was I, just, I read the whole book and I love the book. And the book is in me, by the way. But I took just the four agreements here, be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions and always be your best. So I could use it as a handout to share with my clients inside my coaching practice. So I love doing that. Now I could have taken just chapter one and blown it out the water with a map all by itself. He talks about how when we're born, we get domesticated into thought systems and ideals and belief systems. And we didn't sign up any for any of that, you know, which was superimposed on us. <laughs> we get domesticated, so to speak. But as we mature and we grow, there's some things we want to unsubscribe to. He's like, I don't agree with that or believe that or it's not working. And so it's time to create new agreements. And these are some of the ones that he sets forth according to the Toltec system. And I love them because they're universal and they're principles. It's not about belief system. Be impeccable with your word. Now, this one's important, and I'm just going to read the little, little extra piece there. He says here, be impeccable with your word. Speak with integrity. Say only what you mean and avoid using the word to speak against yourself or to gossip about others. Use the power of the word in the presence, the power of your word in the direction of truth and love. Now, in the book, he goes on to talk about when we speak negatively of others, he says, and you gossip, that's akin to practicing black magic. So we must learn to be impeccable with our word and stay away from negative conversations and getting embroiled in all the blah, blah, blah going on out here. He's like, don't do it. <laughs> be impeccable. And that's really a job for all of us. So see, we can go deep and wide with this conversation, but that's an overview of the book. Someone says, what are the four agreements? Here they are. Now, I was asked to do a webinar for one of my clients, Georgia State University, and they wanted me to talk about dealing with difficult people. But then there was a whole conversation about saying no, because people are encroaching on each other's boundaries and people are expecting you to do their work for them. And it just got into a whole thing. <laughs> I was like, OK, how about this? <clears throat> so I use this book here, which I really like, called The Art of Saying No. Really good. And I created a series of maps and then I use these in my PowerPoint and I created a whole webinar from the book and I made sure that it was interactive with the participants and they flipped out and absolutely loved it. So here we are. I'll just show you the series of maps just on this one book so that you can see how you can go deep and wide with the content, the art of saying no. All right. And there is the, um, the people pleasing habit. There you have it. See the difference there. I mean, are all the details there? And here's the reasons we struggle to say no. <laughs> and with the software, I can use imagery and I can import all kinds of things to jazz them up based on the content. Then there's uh, the reason we struggle to say no part two. All right. A little, I mean, a little bit more continued. And then I've got 10 strategies for saying no. Oh, yeah. OK, so there's like detail how to information. So this is the first five. Be direct. Don't stall. Uh, another word for no. Don't offer excuses. OK, take ownership. And then the last one here was the second five. Ask for follow up. Avoid lying. Don't lie. <laughs> OK, another alternative. Uh, you can make suggestions. Well, another alternative, you know, could be this as a rebuttal instead of just, you know, like saying, all right, I'll do the job when you don't want to and you don't know how to say no <clears throat> and suggestions and then your bandwidth. So this is an example of how I blew out a book and turned it into a webinar for a specific purpose. Is that helpful? I hope so. Here's a series of maps. 
on trading. So during the pandemic, I got involved with a wealth building group and they were teaching us how to trade and invest. Oh my God, it was so juicy. So I started, it was so much information. I had to get my head around it all. I'm like, oh my God, what are we talking about here? All these strategies, all these investment possibilities. So I started with the basics. I would take lots of notes and I put them together for my benefit. And then I started to uh, become more fluid in sharing with others in my community and my family what I was learning. So the three trading markets, the foreign exchange market, which is currencies all over the world. Then there's equities and options in the stock market. And then crypto, which is a new kid on the block. And as you can see here, I've got lots of detail based on what I learned. I learned that we know how to make money and we know how to spend it for sure. The thing is time to learn how to invest it properly, not just the traditional. Um, these are some of the traditional methods, okay? But that with crypto and there's a whole new world that's opening up. And this was a series of maps that I created based on that you know community and that framework that I was involved with. But one of the things that I did was I created benchmarks for myself. So I created 30-day goals, 90-day goals, six months goals, and one-year goals. Now, this was all scratchy stuff <laughs> by hand. But then as I progressed through it and I started to share what I was learning with others, I said, oh, let me put this together so that I can show what I did and my progression and how I achieved and exceeded the benchmarks. So there's a saying write the vision and make it plain. <laughs> you got to write it down, okay? That's the first part. Here is a map of a program that I have called Ligma, which means let it go, move on, and the benefits for the new trainers or facilitators that I was teaching. I said, hey, you're going to develop a skill set. You're going to put it into practice. You know, lifetime, you're going to make a time commitment of such and such. You're going to learn how to become a more effective coach and develop leadership skills. And then here's a much more detailed map on the training and what it consists of. So I wanted it to be neat, comprehensive for someone else that was involved in the process with me. You like that? All right. So those are the lovely mind maps. So now here comes the low down and dirty. Here's a map from a book called Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Maps. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This book is so good. It's kind of like, you know, men are from Mars and women for Venus because it explains the differences between our genders and what's really going inside of our neurophysiology and our perceptions. I absolutely loved it. So that was a hand-drawn map. And... There was a second part, all right? So you can see I use color, I'll sit and I'll just watch. And I did just a little bit here from each chapter with this one. Then I started to blow out each of points from the different chapters. I love this book. Here's another book called Secrets of the Cervical Spine. Oh, and I use lots of color with there. You can see, see how much detail there is in that. Now understand something. I can't sit here and just, I could sit here and go over all of this with you and share with you what I got out of it, but that's not the purpose of this video and we don't have enough time for that. What I want to do is, again, just show you a model of how much time and energy I spent in my conversation with the author and that I honored them by taking notes, read a little bit, do a little mind mapping, read a little bit, do a mind mapping. Or some people read all the way through and then go back and capture the essence based on their mental model and how much detail they want or need. So you get to say, because you're in charge of your learning experience. So that secret is of the cervical spine. Here's another one. And that was chapter five. This is chapter seven. He talked about social choices, okay? The choices that we're making that have an impact on our health, our spine, you know, our nervous system. Cigarette smoking, unhealthy lifestyle, blood supply, something called poison theory, alcohol, narcotics, and illicit drugs, the impact of, impact of these things on our system. And we have to understand that and take ownership of it. And as you notice here, I've got a little sketch pad, okay? And I keep my maps here together and there's lots of them and I'm going to suggest that you do the same for efficiency. Now here's a bigger sketch pad because <laughs> sometimes you want to stretch out and you need a little more room <laughs> to do your mind mapping. This is called The Inner Game by Robert Diltz, The New Developments in NLP. 
So he talks the first, second, and third generation of NLP, and he asks this question, well, what do I currently practice in my life, and what am I learning through my practice? Because he says, you are what you practice. And then he goes on to talk about skill development and some other things that are really good. And I really enjoyed my time with Robert Diltz, my conversation with the author. Let's see what else we got in this collection. Because there are many. Okay, here's another one. This one's called Heart Intelligence from Dr. Joe Dispenza's book called Becoming Supernatural. This was just one chapter. And I loved it so much. I was like, wow, this goes deep and why? And this guy can talk, let me tell you, but he's got substance. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, let me capture that. Dr. Joe, he's 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 really something else. So that's just an example. And then there's many more inside of this. Let me show you a couple little baby maps. This one here is called the Eightfold Path. That is... Uh, from the Buddhist tradition, I was talking with someone. I was like, yeah, the Four Noble Poet Paps, and the Buddha talks about the Four Noble, the four noble Truths, and which are, I know those by heart. He says, um, <clears throat> the first one is life is suffering. And the second one is that all suffering is a result of attachment to desire. And number three, number three is the cessation of suffering must be realized. Like it has to come to an end at some point. And the fourth noble truth is the way out is the eightfold path. And then I was like, right thinking, right concentration, right attitude, right mindfulness, right livelihood. So I couldn't remember them all. So I just went and looked them up and created a little map. Right view, right understanding, right speech. Be impeccable with your word, <laughs> right? Right action, right vocation, right mindfulness, right concentration, and right effort. So it doesn't have to like be that deep. It could be something simple like this, just as a reminder to solidify it, to get it in you and make it fun because it's your experience. It's your notes to yourself. Who are you doing this for? <laughs> you do it for yourself first and foremost. And then if you want to share it with others, you can create the beautiful maps like you've seen me do if you want to. This was a little bitty notebook or journal, as you can see. And I was listening to a talk, or uh, I think called Show Me the Funny by Andy Dooley. I love Andy Dooley. <laughs> and he was talking, he was just carrying on. And I was like, whip this out. And I just took something quickly and just made some little, little scratchy notes there. So, you know, you can do this anytime, anywhere. It's not that complicated. It's not that deep. I'm currently reading a book called The Middle Passage. It says here, From Misery to Meaning in Midlife. And it talks about, oh my God, so many wonderful things, but how when we first grow, well, let me show you the map first, but this is the map. I used to just keep maps and I would make a map and then I'd stick it with the book. I just put them in the book like that. Then I decided, no, I think the notepads are more efficient. And I think that is the best way. However, sometimes I'll pick up a book and I'll see an old map like this. I'm like, oh my God. And then I'll look at it and then I'll start again with the book. Well, I started this book about six months ago. And then I was like, oh my God, it's so juicy, but I've got so many books. I'm loving all these conversations with y'all. They're my friends. I'm like hanging out with this one, hanging out with that one. In any case, I revisited this one. Oh my God. So here's the map and it's so good. And this is a little bitty, bitty, little bitty book. It's just 120 pages, but I decided to go back and revamp this map and create some others because I'm gonna use this content as a teaching tool as well. He starts talking about our identity, like in the first part of our lives, we have like our, our childhood, we have something called, you know, our first identity childhood. And that's based on dependency of the parents. You start, you know, developing ego formation. And this is Jungian psychology, by the way. And then our second identity forms in like in puberty. But check this out, he said something that was so interesting. That's roughly from 12 to 40, <laughs> our second identity, 12 to 40, which is the first adulthood, which is a provisional existence and personality. It's pretty superficial, actually. In other words, you don't start waking up till you get to be like 30 and 40. <laughs> it gets good. Then there's the third identity. This is the second adulthood where all your projections and all your stuff starts to be dissolved and you start to let go of all the ridiculous and all the BS or belief systems that have been superimposed upon you talked about in the four agreements. And the fourth identity is our spiritual self or our God self, because without a relationship to the divine or some higher awareness of who we are in the big scheme of things, it's like, what's it all about? We're part of a big cosmic drama. 
but the way in which he writes, the conversation is so rich, so deep. I'm like, oh my God. Then I'll look at the book. I'm like, James Hollis, who is this guy? Look him up. I'm like, oh, I love him. So see what you do with the content of any book and where you go and how deep and wide you go in your dialogue with the author. It just depends on you. I love reading, but I get into a relationship with the author. And this one here is worth my time. This is my dude. This is my dude. I'm like, oh, I love him. I'm learning so much about myself. And as a result, I'm able to relate to others in their different stages of development differently in a bigger way. I can observe without judgment. I watch people I'm like, oh, wow, I get it. Mm -hmm. Been there, done that. <laughs> Love them. They're coming along. It's okay. Let it play out. Because <laughs> it has to. You can't control anything or anybody except thyself, myself, yourself. So that's the, the gist of it. Here's a little map that I love in closing. And I love Dr. Sheely. Oh my God, learning strategies, Pete Bissonette. <laughs> Here's the point. When we, when, we, when we work with people, we understand intelligence and the new model of intelligence. Here's a little mini map. It honors not only just your IQ, you know, because Dr. Sheely's like, you have natural genius. You're naturally brilliant. Okay, yeah. And we honor that IQ, but that's not all there is. There's EQ, that's a whole nother body of work called emotional intelligence. There's PQ, physical intelligence, because the body is super smart. You know, like you don't, you don't like consciously control your own respiration and heartbeat. You know, the body is super smart. PQ, physical intelligence. And we've got to take care of the body and honor our temples. And then there's SQ, which is spiritual intelligence or existentialist intelligence, a bigger understanding that like you are here on the map and you're a part of something bigger than just yourself. <laughs> yeah. So we, we approach people in our connection and relationship with an understanding that this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with you in a holistic way. We see you, your IQ, your EQ, your PQ, your SQ. We're like, yeah. You're amazing. You're beautiful. You're a growing, ever expanding spiritual being having this marvelous experience. And let's do it with joy. Let's have fun together. And, you know, like using tools like mind mapping and photo reading and genius code and million dollar vocabulary and all that jazz. <laughs> so we are lifelong learners. That's the essence of it. We are a community of learners. And a lover, I like to say, lovers of learning. We want to model that for you. And we want to encourage you to become a lover of learning. Because learning extends way beyond the classroom. You know, some people are like, yeah, once I get out of school, I never want to see books again. It's like, no, you'll actually be learning for the rest of your life. Certainly, hopefully you will be. <laughs> and doing it with joy and a great attitude. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and for allowing me to share. And I will see you in the next session.